Welcome to Startup Hacks, a We Global Studios podcast. We explore the stories and secret strategies that women entrepreneurs use to save time and money when bootstrapping and building their businesses. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina, and today I'm so excited to welcome Margot Shapiro. Margot is a managing director at Spiral Sun Ventures, a venture capital firm located in Orange County, which invests in early stage CPG companies that promote a healthier lifestyle with a particular focus in the food, beverage, and personal care sectors. She uses a broad resource network and collaborative partnerships with visionary founders to help accelerate the growth of young companies on a path to success. Welcome, Margo. Hi, Fernanda. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you, Margo, at long last. And at long last. <laughs> at long last, exactly. But our audience is going to be very excited and thrilled to hear your story because it's such a great one. So I thought I would start, if you don't mind, by just giving us a little backstory on you, where you grew up, what your life was like as a, as a young kid, where you went to school, and how you got started as a professional early days to just kind of set the backdrop. Um, I am originally a Midwest native. Uh, I grew up outside of Detroit, and I came from a pretty traditional family background. I had my mother at home, my father at the office, a couple siblings. Um, I spent a lot of time in dance uh, I, since I was very young, in ballet, and a lot of time in, in the arts in general, which is interesting because I didn't really end up in the arts, but those are all of my hobbies and my interests. I had a job serving frozen yogurt when it first came out. Can anybody remember that? <laughs> like yes, dairy made. Been with us. <laughs> So when it came out as a product, I thought it was really cool, and I decided I wanted to be employee number one, giving out samples at the door, since I really like talking to new people. And so I was the person at the door, and people always thought they knew me. When, but anyway, I didn't really have any female role models in business until college, probably. Um, I went to Stanford and was an earth science major. I know a lot of your guests say that their majors have nothing to do with the careers they eventually ended up in. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's kind of me too. But I actually graduated in four years with a, a BS in earth science and a master's in petroleum geology. Wow. Um, I know, funny, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there was an oil glut when I graduated, so that, that didn't happen. But freshman year, I had also taken a one-unit class on the stock market because I had some interest there. And so I took a part-time job slash internship kind of thing at a brokerage house for a whopping $50 a month, I think, Mm -hmm. um, with a woman named Elise Papp. And she ultimately became my mentor and she's my good friend to this day. She was totally amazing. She was a a feminist who was at Berkeley in the 70s, and she became a psychologist, and then she changed careers at the age of 30 to become a stockbroker because she felt women should know how to control their own finances. And I was really struck by that and how difficult it probably was for her to be the only woman in her office. She had a pretty difficult office manager. But at night, she would have groups of women come to her house for short seminars in financial literacy. And they, you know, they loved it and I loved it. So the upshot there is that my first job when I graduated college, I ended up joining Goldman Sachs in New York in investment banking. And I was a financial analyst in their real estate department, which was crazy. It was like 80 or 90 hour work weeks and, um, you know, fun and a lot of camaraderie, but still tough. And I I later did a stint in sales and trading because I wanted to just before I left the firm. I went to Harvard after that for my MBA. Um, And after, after that, I went to private equity back in New York for a small leverage buyout firm. We bought small to medium sized companies. And our portfolio was about 30 companies in total. So I was doing you know, the kinds of things that early MBAs do, like analytics and financial forecasting. 
um, it was in the late 80s, and we worked with a firm called Drexel Burnham a lot, and Mike Milliken doing leverage buyouts. There was a lot of debt involved. It was a good lesson, what not to do. But what I really loved, um, I think at that time, about reviewing so many companies were was it, were the meetings with management, seeing how things were made, all the factory tours and such like that. But somewhere around that time, I met my husband in New York, and we got married. We eventually started having children, and I became interested in education, so I moved to a test prep company called Kaplan. They're also in New York, and, and I worked in business development and headed up their book publishing efforts. And eventually we moved to Michigan for my husband's work. Um, he was also from the Midwest, and we both grew up there. I think we both wanted a more balanced life. We, around that time, had our third child, and I decided to stay home and make family my work for a while. I went on philanthropy boards. I worked at the kids' school, but after about Three years or so, I got a little antsy, and I was looking to get back to work in some form. So I wanted to, you know, do something that I could be a part of and set an example for my kids one day. And what was that? Right around then, I, I had heard that University of Michigan's Ross Business School had received a donation from two two fellows, Sam Zell and his partner, Robert Lurie, and they were going to start an entrepreneurship institute, but I had zero connections there. Um, so I cold called the executive director and found out what the story was. And she said that within the institute, the idea was to create something called the Wolverine Venture Fund, where they were going to have 30 graduate business students, 15 first years, 15 second years, and they would learn through this process to invest a fund of roughly a million dollars. And when I visited, it was literally she and I. She had no staff, and she said, I don't even have any deals for the kids to review. So I, you know, raised my hand. I'm like, I'll, I'll find some deals for them. I, I'll strike out and, and see what I can do. So I went around Ann Arbor, and I met with partners from – I think there are seven or so venture firms around Ann Arbor. One of them was run by Rick Snyder, who eventually became the governor of Michigan. Mm. And I literally picked up printed bound deal books because nothing was digitized back then. This is the, the late 90s even, but they were still bound books. And I carted them back to review them with the kids. So, I mean, I think that that was, what I would say were, was the start of two great things in my life, um, venture capital and mentorship. I really loved mentoring them. And during that time, was it a pretty male-dominated area of venture capital? It was. It was. It absolutely was, except one of the firms was run by a, a female, and she was dynamic. She was an, an, an advisor, um, to the Wolverine Venture Fund, and she was she was actually really a nice, another good role model. But you know, personally, my schooling and, and my work history were all very male dominated. In geology and the oil industry. Um, when I worked at Goldman, there were no women partners at the time. Business school was even mostly male. So you know, we've all felt it. It, it was it's constantly being in a room filled with men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So after you um, after you helped launch um, their kind of venture effort at University of Michigan, at what point did you start to think about starting your own venture capital firm? So um, we moved to out west eventually after that. Another uh, something else for my husband's work is in real estate. So we were constantly um moving around and, and doing things. But we also moved because we thought it would be a great adventure to be out West. Mm -hmm. And so when I got there, I ultimately started a small venture capital fund in the health and wellness sector with two friends from business school. And uh, we invested our own funds. We didn't have any LPs. 
And our focus was female founded companies because we thought the statistics were just so terrible for women. Mm -hmm. Something like only 3% of female founded firms were venture backed. And, but, but groups like McKinsey were doing research showing that female led companies were generating a 40% higher return on equity. So it just wasn't rational. So that's what we did. And, and we, um, our fund had great exits. And when that was fully invested, my partners wanted to raise money for a different kind of fund. And I joined Spiral Fund Ventures as managing partner so we could, so I could continue investing in health, healthy lifestyle products in the consumer sector. And I'm just curious, given the um, successful exits that you had funding female founders, did you find that during that time when you were doing that, that were you pretty early stage in a, in a commitment to focus on supporting female founders? We invested very early stage, but really we, we kind of, it was a give back type of scenario. We really wanted to be in the areas of clean, green, health, wellness, and education. And we sought out female founders um, because we, we did want to lend support up front. And it, it was, it was uh, beneficial all the way around. It was, it was a win-win. And did you find other places were doing the same or were you guys pretty cutting edge and in, in saying, no, we're going to fund female founders? You know, I think when we started that uh, venture, that's just about the time where female led firms were just starting up because I, I think it was, it was more or less around 10 years ago. Um, I, my statistics might be wrong, but maybe there's only 6% of all um, all venture funds are now female led. And I believe most of them have started in the last five years. Right. So I, in a way, I believe we were trailblazers. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a thesis that we thought was revolutionary at the time. It was just a feeling we had that this was something that we needed to do that we saw in the marketplace that wasn't happening. I was part of Tech Coast Angels uh, in Southern California, and they were constantly trying to get more female members as angel funders. So mm. angel is, is really the kind of funding that happens before venture firms get involved. And it was really difficult. I mean, they were trying their hardest. Richard Sudek, who is an amazing leader of, uh, he was the executive director of, of two different schools, entrepreneurship institutes, universities, and he was trying to uh, do partnerships with Golden Seeds, which is a phenomenal organization of women funders that fund female founders. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a tongue twister, but, and there's another one, Astia, that mm -hmm. was starting up in California, and they are also tremendous. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the angel groups <clears throat> were male dominated. So, yes, there were there were at the time it was a relatively rare thing that that has happened. And now the statistics are still not great, um, but there's a lot more interest and a lot more women are getting involved. So let's talk a little bit about um, about the um, the VC firm that you that you actually are, are now managing partner of Spiral Sun Ventures. So uh, walk the audience through a little bit of the investment thesis for, for that venture company and, um, and some of the successes that you've had. Sure. Um, so we at Spiral Sun say that we invest in healthy um, we're the healthiest fund under the sun, and, <laughs> and we invest in, we have all of these two things, taglines, we invest in healthy products with a clean conscience. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> our mission, we did some rebranding this year, so it's very fun. Our mission is to, to really be the, the premier early stage investor in companies that promote a healthier lifestyle. And we're pretty much in four buckets. We're in food and beverage personal care, and pet. And then we also 
uh, invest in the tech that supports them. Mm. And why is because consumers are basically demanding healthier products that that with functional ingredients that provide benefits like gut health and more energy and brain health and more sustainably produced, including the packaging. Um, I think people eat six times the amount of sugar today than they did in 1960, which is not good. Yeah. Uh, another terrible statistic is that chronic diseases cost our country something like three and a half trillion a year. And a lot of this can be prevented with better eating habits, with food as medicine. And that's really the thesis of our fund is that you can actively on your own be proactive about your health instead of wait until you get sick and be reactive um, and take medicines. So there's, there's a functionality to food as medicine and, and we believe strongly in it. And another angle of that is, is that over the next 30 years or so, we'll need to feed maybe 25% more people globally. And, and we have diminishing resources and there's climate change and it's, it's difficult. So we also focus on alternative ways that people might be fed. So the future of food, new right. ag tech solutions, new biosystems, things like that. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and in just the past, to, yeah, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say in the past year, the pandemic has underscored how people want to be proactive about their health. I, I think that one of the most Google words, Googled words last year was immunity. <laughs> and we're in the sweet spot of that, you know, mm -hmm. as we invest in better for you brands that hopefully will bolster your health, your immunity. Um, and overall, I would say the mission of, of our firm is to transform big CPG, and when I say CPG, it's consumer products goods, into a healthier version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So if it's a Campbell's soup, you know, maybe it won't just be um, soup in a can. Um, it'll be uh, Skinny Souping, which is, which is a company that we invested in, which is all plant-based and all natural ingredients and delicious, and you can eat it hot or cold. And hmm. um, there, there are great... Uh, great companies around that that there's a lot of fantastic food <laughs> that uh, that we focus on and um do you any bragging rights you want to you want to share of any companies that you invested in that have done really well so this last year was really interesting because i would say eight percent of people used to buy groceries online and and during the pandemic 40 percent did so, I mean, there was a big shift in what was going on and companies had to really reorganize themselves. So we have a company, Farmer's Fridge, that uh, has smart refrigerators and it delivers really healthy meals that are accessible to everybody through vending machines. And they were in LaGuardia and Kennedy and O'Hare and lots and lots of office buildings, 400 uh, outlets and they were doing terrifically, and a fantastic um, entrepreneur, Luke, Luke Saunders. And what happened during the epidemic was during the pandemic was they lost like 85% of their revenue over a two-week period in March, right after having their best month ever. So, over a weekend, they launched a home delivery website program, and they put. They repurposed all of their vending machines and put them in hospitals and healthcare facilities. And it was a perfect response to COVID in a way because it was contactless and right. it's a way to serve food in, in hospitals. So the idea was to make fresh, healthy meals and people were able to get them. And by May, they had not only replaced all of the revenue they had lost, but they were ahead. Um, so they are versioning. Um, they're a terrific company. I can't tell you what their sales are but they're they're really uh they've really really done well and and probably will have some kind of um exit as as one of our earliest at some point patch of soap is another one they make premium all natural 
handmade bath products and personal care products, including hand soap and frost bombs and whip soaps and bath salts, <laughs> all kinds. They are launching a line of essential oils in Kroger, uh, which they actually it was launched last month. They're a big Whole Foods supplier. I think they won number one supplier in Whole Foods uh, two years ago. And they just saw the growing trend for these sustainable, organic, handmade products. Um, and they're terrific. So yep. they're going in Costco. They, they've had some success there. And um, Pacha's products, I think, are sold in a thousand stores in all regions of the U.S. and Canada. Wow. So really terrific, getting a lot of, I mean, a thousand stores is not a lot, but, but because they were so focused on doing so well in Whole Foods, um, they, um, it, they, they were deep there. Yeah. So we we like have it. a lot of very interesting companies. Yeah. It sounds like it. Well, congratulations. That's a great story. And, and what a great turnaround during COVID also with, yeah, uh, I thought that was with food delivery. That's amazing. So, um, mm -hmm. I want to, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about, um, the hack that we've talked about before that I think is near and dear to your heart that you just touched upon when we were talking about the university story. So as you know, the show is all about how to save time, money, and gain a competitive edge while bootstrapping your business. And founders are always looking for a way to, to you know, save time and to stretch the, the almighty dollar. And even, you know, VCs or angel networks or, or even incubators, accelerators, they're all businesses in, in and of themselves and they need to do the same. And I was just wondering if you would share kind of that big one hack that you and I discussed that is that you love, that you feel is kind of a win-win hack. Okay, I absolutely will. Could I give you a mini hack first? Just yeah, because please. I think it, it it relates to what we were just talking about. Yeah, I think people can use all kinds of great pro great products that enhance their life and make their make themselves feel feel better all the time. So some of the companies that we represent and invest in, um, but but I'll just mention some of the things that that I do and that I eat um, that makes me feel better all the time, and also some kind of cutting edge things that you might not think about. Uh, so Pacha soap I mentioned, um, bone broth meals made with collagen, delicious for you, great for your your body. Um, IQ bar we have, which has brain health ingredients like lion's mane and vitamin E and omega threes and things like that for your brain health. I mentioned farmer's fridge. Then there's things like chickpea ice cream, plant based and creamy. It's delicious. You don't have to eat saturated fat ice creams all the time, even though some people might be keto and feel a different way about it. Uh, and then there's companies like we've invested in a company called Prime Roots, which makes alternative proteins like bacon from koji fungi. Mm -hmm. And it has the same texture as meat. So you can supplant a lot of things in your diet, sodas, drink some kombucha, you know, um, even when you're going to have a drink at home. We invested in a company called Drinksmith, which has fresh pressed organic juice and, and things like that. Anyway, you can do anything in your life, even for your pets. Like we, we have an upcycled pet treat company where food would have been wasted, but instead we have now created these delicious uh, healthy treats for dogs. So th there's a lot out there to do for yourself. And, and I think people should kind of think about uh, how they could live their life one step healthier, a little better for you you know, in quotes, and there's a lot of better for you items out there. So on Got to it. the big, big, <laughs> the big, big hack. <laughs> well, before actually, I'm going to just jump in here for a second, because um, I just realized that we're running low on time and I want to, this is such an important topic and, and one that warrants yeah. a lot of focus. So I think we might have to do a part two, but I'm going to steal your thunder if I, if I may, and, and just Go. say that, um, working with university students is something that you've always been passionate about and that you've mentored and it, being able to provide internships, which are really enriching for students to really learn about the VC world and working with portfolio companies is something that you guys have done quite a bit of and has been incredibly rewarding for students to get really firsthand knowledge. 
and that that is definitely a way that a lot of other organizations have utilized interns as well as one way to kind of you know, save money, but provide a real service to students who are trying to get real boots on the ground experience in the business community. So am I, am I kind of right? Have I touched on the high points there? You touched on all the high points. I think it's important to, to mentor um, young, young people and they learn a lot. We, we throw them into all kinds of projects and we, we leverage them as well as, as they get uh, experience from us in finance and due diligence and marketing and branding. They learn about nutrition, market research, all kinds of things. Um, but they've, they've completed fantastic projects for us and they get I- incredible experience. We give them a mentor. Each intern of ours in our structured program gets a mentor with whom they schedule a weekly call. We have um, mind share programs with them, we call them, uh, we call these, these meetings, and we have meetings on Mondays and Thursdays, and we invite really relevant, terrific um, leaders in our industry, and they learn every asset, every facet of our industry. So yes, we love to we love to bolster their work, their careers, their start them out, and we usually take them as freshmen and sophomores in at our company in particular because we find that it's very hard for for kids to to find their footing when they first start college and also to find a job. And so this way they not only learn about something that, that's incredibly interesting, they, they get some background before they have to decide exactly which way they want to go. Right. Exactly. Well, it's amazing. I think it's great what you guys do. Now, if someone would like to learn more about you, the company, or even your internship program, where could they reach you? They can write to me at Margo with a T at the end at SpiralSunVentures.com. And feel free to reach out We and, and entrepreneurs as well. Um, we don't turn anybody down. We listen to uh, all incoming calls. And we, we try and mentor as many students as we can during the year. We'll, we take interns during the year. Um, in the summer last year, we had five. We'll probably have five again this year. Great, great. And they're all rock stars. They're terrific. Well, thank you. Um, Well, thank you again. And tune in next week for more Startup Hacks. We have another great show, and you won't want to miss on the secret female founder strategies that will save you time and money when building your business. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by We Global Studios, the first startup innovation studio and digital do-it-yourself startup platform for women entrepreneurs around the world. For more information on our guests, this podcast, and many other female founder programs, please visit weglobalstudios.com. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina, and we will see you next week.